Ahí va a llegar el gol del Arsenal Ofil. Marca Mesut Ofil. Envío al área, al remate. Ahí está el primer tanto del partido. No lo celebra, por supuesto. Aaron Ramsey, 0 a 1 para el Arsenal. This is Arscast Extra. Got your homework. Yeah. I've got my homework. You got your homework. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to a live Arscast Extra. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening to good, everyone. Good evening, indeed. Or goodly, whatever time of day it is to the people who aren't listening as well. I think we've got to pay them some respects to them. Do we? Nah, forget. Nah, it's all about <laughs> the people. It's all about the people here tonight. So, yeah. fair enough. So, um, I assume you were uh, at the wedding on Saturday, were you? you I was, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I How was, was in the gospel choir. Did you not notice me? <laughs> I, I was still at the back. Uh, no, I wasn't actually, but I did watch it. I wasn't interested in it, but I watched it nonetheless, which makes me the worst kind of person, probably. Why did you uh, watch it? Because I sort of, why did I watch it? Yeah. No football anymore. <laughs> So you're, you're basically a glutton for punishment, any kind of punishment. Yeah, and a glutton for television, basically. Yeah. So <laughs> whatever's on, I will watch it. It happened to be two people I don't know getting married. I, I indulged, what can I say? It's an amazing thing, two people getting married. It, it's a rare, a rare occurrence. Yeah, it never happens. There should no. be more of them on telly, shouldn't there? <laughs> Just, Just more random... people you don't know getting married on TV. Random weddings. Yeah. yeah. Did you not watch it? No. I thought maybe not, no. No. <laughs> it wasn't really, uh, wasn't really high on my agenda. It wasn't your cup of tea? No. No. What did you do this weekend? I got up really early uh, because a puppy made me got up really early. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And then I ran around with the puppy and played with the puppy and just basically a lot of puppy. Right. <laughs> yeah. You've sort of adopted the puppy's lifestyle as your own, haven't you? Apart from the, the, the urination. <laughs> Pooing and, in the garden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to cut you that out. You've been doing that for years before. Yeah, I know, I know. At least you've got a friend to do it with now. Right. <laughs> I've got two of them, two of them. <laughs> but anyway, thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see everyone. We are going to talk a lot about uh, Arsenal. It's been an interesting few weeks mm -hmm. um, in many respects. We're moving into a new era, but there's still uh, an old era that we can talk about a little bit with our guests who we're going to bring up on stage now. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you give a, a warm welcome to Amy Lawrence and Philippe Claire, please. <laughs> Very comfy. You got the comfy one. We made Ooh, James sit on the, the bad yeah, chair. Yeah, I mean, people who are listening to this won't stand, but they've all got lovely sort of leather armchairs, or maybe pleather. I don't know if it's real. I've got a little plastic chair <laughs> that I have to sit on. It's, it's, good for, it's good for your posture. It's very good for my posture, to be fair. I'm not going to hurt myself doing this. Well, we'll see. There's a long time to go. There is, and it's quite the drop off this stage. So. <laughs> um, anyway, you guys, how are you? Not too bad, thank you very much, Andrew. Good. Thank you for asking us uh, to be here tonight. Um, just a little bit frazzled, I think, by everything. Yeah, it's been eventful. To say the least, yes. Yes. To say the least. And um, trying to make sense of it is not that simple. I think we've all been through the, the Wrangler over the last three weeks. Yeah. Uh, Wrangler, Wenger, you know. Wenger, Wrangler. Yeah, Wenger, Wrangler. Arson, Wrangler. I don't yeah. know. So, Philippe, let me ask we, you, um, the last few weeks since we had this announcement about Arsene Wenger leaving. How have you felt about the way it's all played out? You know, I deliberately didn't ask you on the podcast because no. I knew we were doing this, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to... Just your general feeling before we get into specifics. Uh, I think I went a bit... You know, when there's this Simpsons episode in which Homer Simpson is told, you know, you've only got like five months to live, and he goes through every possible reaction you can possibly have within 30 seconds. Yeah. And that's about me. Uh, <laughs> so the first one was surprise, because I don't think anybody was expecting the announcement to be made at that time. Uh, the second was resignation uh, and perhaps relief. I said, yeah, that's what should have happened perhaps you know, one or two or even three seasons ago. And then there's a sense of grieving starting to, you know, to kick in and the fact that you realize you're going to be through this mourning period, basically. And uh, you realize what Arsene has brought to the club and then suddenly you are able to take perhaps a more objective or more sensitive, more rational uh, view as to what he has brought to the club. And then you start, you start grieving. I think it was awake. When he, when he talked about being a witness at his own funeral, 
Um, I thought, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think the first piece I wrote about his departure was about uh, Charles V, you know, the uh, Spanish come Belgium emperor, who really wanted to know what people thought of him and decided to have his own funeral stage while he was still alive. Ah, that's clever. Well, yes, but well, depending yes, on what people, people think. Yes, but people knew he was still alive, so they were crying a lot. But maybe they wouldn't have cried otherwise. <laughs> crying uh, tears. But in this particular case, it was drawn out, but in a strange way. And I think Amy will agree with me because and you were there too, and we were there for the the final game at the Emirates, and it was a magnificent occasion. Mm. So we had a chance to to say goodbye to to our big guy. Yeah. In a proper way. Uh, under beautiful blue Arsenal skies. Yeah. Just like, as we said, you know, when Tony Adams scored that goal, when Freddie Ljungberg scored against um, mm. the other guys in Cardiff. And um, in the end, you're left a bit bereft and also a bit nonplussed because I genuinely think that this season, going beyond Wenger, is really a, a page being turned not just for our club, but also Buffon is leaving Juve, Fergie had his health problems, Per is retiring, Andres Iniesta is retiring, mm. Fernando Torres is retiring. You really Santi get Cazorla. Santi Cazorla is unfortunately, we'll, I'm He's sure leaving. we'll come back to that, going to Villarreal and not staying at, at, mm. at the, play, the place where he really belongs, I believe. Um, so you get the feeling, yeah, end of an era, and uh, you look at yourself. I think, I think a lot of us, actually, if, if we look around, I mean, there are quite a few people who've never known any other manager, right? Mm. I would imagine so I can see a few heads nodding, like cars, that like dogs at the back of a car. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've known a couple of other managers, but that's about it. Yeah. So I feel really strange about it. Amy, did you, did you enjoy it the last few weeks? I mean, was there enough in it to enjoy as a, a thing? Because normally managers leaving a football club, it's a bit more abrupt than than this was. Do you know what? I, surprisingly, I did enjoy it. And what I enjoyed was that everybody felt good again. And for the last, I don't know, however many seasons, depending on your point of view, it might be more recent or it might stretch back further back. But most Arsenal fans have reached a point where they weren't really enjoying it anymore. The atmosphere has been complicated and difficult and frustrating and people have had so many mixed emotions and then even to have this divided fan base has been you know really awful and when i think back to my um young years as a fan that's one thing that didn't exist it wasn't a divided fan base it was a really unified fan base where arsenal could you know would go wherever and take on any situation and you felt like everybody was in it together and it felt like the club the team the players the fans were all in it against everybody else. So for Arsenal to be fighting amongst itself was really, was really hard to, to take, actually. And I don't know whether that's going to change going forward because, you know, you look at social media and even in this age of rumours that we're in at the moment and it's all all over the place. So it's hard to predict whether suddenly a new person comes in and everybody is suddenly u unified again. But it just felt so great and I think it, it, meant, it really meant something to most fans, if not all, and to Arsene, to remember kind of why everybody loved each other, why Arsene fell in love with the club, why the fans fell in love with Arsene uh, and what he brought at his best. Mm. Um, so that was a big thing for me. I think the only other things were there's, there's sort of how you view it in your professional head and how you view it personally. And... I, I, you know, I, I found Arsene to be just the most amazing person to listen to. And I think back to the very first press conferences when he arrived 22 years ago and the majority of people didn't know him terribly well. Um, and I remember going to these press conferences and sitting there and listening to this guy and th coming out every time thinking, Jesus Christ, I thought I, I thought I knew something about football. And he was just making me think about things and challenging my preconceptions every single time he opened his mouth. You know, we'd go once a week, and in those days it was 
it was much more fun because there used to be maybe eight or ten journalists in a room and we'd sit around the table with him and he'd give us maybe half an hour of his time and that would allow him to really open up and think about things and go off on tangents and you could ask interesting questions and now it's just, you know, transfer rumours, are you going to sign a new contract? It's pretty boring fair in the main, it's changed. But those early days were incredible and he did come with this new world vision that he has. He's a very broad-minded guy. You can ask him about anything. I remember Lee Dixon once telling me that you could ask him about what kind of duvet to, ha- to get, and he'd tell you <laughs> a really interesting answer. Um, it, Hopefully that's in the book. <laughs> well, <laughs> a whole chapter on duvets and mattresses. Yeah. So I think in the end, anyway, basically, apart from duvet... The, the, most people realised that it, it, it was time or it was maybe a bit overdue, but I just think it made, us all, it made me realise how much I, I liked him as a human being and still like him as a human being. And I'm, I'm glad that he got that time where he was uh, revered again, uh, where, where he felt the love. One thing I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, Philippe, because you know, you've spent a lot of time in Arsenal's company in press conferences or interviews, is what do you think this period of time meant to him? How do you think it affected him? Do you think he enjoyed it? Would you go as far as to say he enjoyed it? Or do you think he found it difficult? What was your impression of how this experience played out for Arsen? I think it's the question he's asking himself right now. It's his life. It has been his life. I mean, people exaggerate when they say that there is no Arsene Wenger between you know, the moment that he leaves his, um, his house and goes to the training ground, goes to the game and so forth, that he has no life. He does have a life. He doesn't talk about it. It's a very private life. But on the other hand, I don't think he's ever stopped to consider what he has done throughout all these years. Perhaps sometimes, uh, at the end of a season, he would do what the French would call an examen de conscience, which is almost like a religious exercise, and it would be before you're going to confession, saying, what have I done right, what have I done wrong? And he used to do that. He's always done that, and he's probably still doing it right now. But it would be only be for a couple of days, um, think about what he'd achieved or not achieved, and then take decisions. But he's never, I think, sat back and thought about his involvement with Arsenal. He became very emotional um, very, very early on. He found the place for him, and you know, because of that, and because of the kind of man he is, working, and he does work, 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, it's only now that it's finally sinking in. And I think one of the loveliest things which have happened over the last few, the last three weeks, is that it's sunk in, as far as he's concerned, how much people genuinely loved him. Because we've got to remember Arsene, not that long ago, talking about people, people, and, and, and talking about us, guys, you know, talking about the fans, and, and thinking that there was some kind of disconnect, as people would say now, between him and, and the crowd. And he suddenly realized, well, actually, no, there isn't. I'm part of that family. I'm, I'm an Arsenal man through and through. And when I would genuinely think when you said that, when the question was asked him, would you sit in the North Bank? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think he's actually sincere. And um, that for him, it's absolutely awful what, he has to ha- what he's had to go through. But at the same time, it's an affirmation of, of the quite extraordinary love he has for this club and for his fans. So it's quite beautiful, really. I think what's interesting, Philippe, just hearing you say that, is that when he does stop and think about it all, I'm quite interested in how he really reflects about the difficult time and some of the yeah. vitriol and some of that stuff. Because I think when it's happening and you're in the middle of it and you're, when you're a manager and you're just in that zone of preparing for games and you have the game and then you have the warm down the next day and even if it's gone wrong, you still do that and then you're preparing for the next game. He's always had that thing where it's about the next game, it's about the next game. No matter what's going on in the form, if you're invincible or if you're losing every game away from home, that's how he operates, that's how he thinks. And I don't think he allows himself to get too, um, uh, to get, for it to get too under his skin what people are saying, what people are thinking. It's, it's somewhere over there, you know. Mm. I mean, he's obviously aware of it, but I, I think it, a, he's got a defence mechanism, which means I can't allow this to get under my skin. So it, in, in future, when he's had a bit of time, I think it would be really interesting if he actually analyses how, you know, how hard that was, how stressful that period was for him. Yeah, I mean, people look at him as a manager, but, you know, we are reminded that he's also a man and a person. Um, you... you 
spoke to him quite soon after the announcement was made that Friday when the announcement was made and on, on the day actually on the day yeah. and and you we, we spoke about it a little bit and you said he was quite angry and he yep. he's spoken about his shock only last week he said he's still shocked by by everything so what was your sense from talking to him about how this decision was communicated and, and everything else <laughs> it was not his decision mm. I think we can all agree on that. Mm -hmm. It might be a decision that he was um, persuaded to make his own, but that's about as far as I would go. He didn't want to go. I think that last year, um, he genuinely thought about calling it a day after the uh, FA Cup final, the win over Chelsea. And many people think that it would have been the perfect time for him to, you know, bite farewell to everybody. And it seems that he was actually asked to carry on and that he was genuinely believing that he wouldn't be for one season only, but for two seasons, that he would go to the end of, of his contract. Um, judging by his reaction, I'm not saying he said that verbatim because that would be uh, betraying his word, mm -hmm. but judging by the tone of his reaction, that's not the case. He's been pushed out. We shouldn't, we shouldn't you know, kid ourselves that it sure. was a decision taken common with the board or anything like that. He would, he would have loved to stay. Do you think with the passing of a, a few weeks that he might recognize it as a good decision for him? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> that was my Vangorian here. Yes. <laughs> um, Look Which good. is a very strange kind of English because one, one of the most amazing things about Wenger, when you say he's the man who doesn't evolve, he's a revolutionary who doesn't evolve, his accent hasn't changed. Listen to his first press conference. Yeah. He spoke better English then. <laughs> Honestly. Um, what it might have done, though, paradoxically and not so paradoxically when you know a bit about him, is that he's got a new impetus, I think. He looks rejuvenated to me. Whereas the Arsene of the last few years, very often you felt, the, I'm talking to an old man here, mm. it, it, it changed because sometimes after a great win, I, after the 2 nil against the unmentionables this, this, this season, he was actually looked really happy and you know, had a spring in his step and so forth. Sometimes he looked like he had a, a winter in his step too. And, and now it's, it's quite different. I think he's, he wants to uh, show people that he still got it. So I'm absolutely convinced he's going to bounce back and go to another club. Yeah, you think I'm I was... absolutely convinced he's going to try his darndest to, to do that and, to, and not to manage a, a national team, not yet, but to find a club in which he can have a short to medium term project in which he's going to show people, you know what, I can still do it. I can still, you know, I can show those guys. Mm. Amy, with Arsene gone and we can talk about who is going to replace him or might replace him, um, the, there's a very clear power shift, um, I think, was illustrated by the decision to hold a press conference um, the day that the announcement was made, and Ivan Gazidis was the guy who gave that press conference. He put himself front and centre. I think we in can... In the manager's chair. In the manager's chair in the press room, yeah. Well... <laughs> but... We don't need to read between the lines too far to see, to see what's going on here. And we have, obviously, new structures being put in place with a, a director of football and a, a head of recruitment from Borussia Dortmund, um, which seems to be just recruit from Borussia Dortmund at the moment, but hopefully he'll expand his horizons a bit. Um, do you have confidence that this new structure can work? Or I don't know because you know we're all waiting to see how they deal with their first major decision. Oh, well, the first major decision was obviously involving Arsene moving on, but the the repercussions of that, uh, who comes in, it was it inevitably is going to be a, a, a culture shock because things have to change. I think what's interesting about it is you can be emotional and you can judge it with all those feelings that you have, but when you talk about a new structure being in place that's that was needed you know um you have to, to to say that that's probably the right thing to do to to evolve and not be running the same kind of a way that you were running in 
in the in the in the nineteen whatever it was eighties or nineties back at Highbury. You know the game has changed radically since then, and Arsenal needed to have a shake up, and it's really doing that. And it's not just obviously Arsenal is the the most um, ginormous part of this change, but you can look around at the other jobs that have gone at the training ground, some of which were not expected at all. Um, there's change at youth development. They've obviously waited a year for Perma Saka to hang up his boots and, and go and take over uh, Hale End. So there's lots of stuff going on. Um, and when, you know, while the focus naturally is going to be who is the new manager, stroke head coach, stroke whatever we call him, that you know, there's going to be a, a whole bunch of new people around, and how quickly they can create a new culture or evolve the culture that's there or shake things up. We're, we've just got to sit back and 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 hope and and watch and and see how it, how everything. You know, it's like throwing everything up in the air. It's all coming back down differently, yeah. and we don't know what that difference is really going to look like yet. It's interesting, isn't it? Because Miss Lintat, if I remember rightly, came in before Christmas last year. It was kind of November. Yeah, time. November. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then Rao Sanye was February kind of time, but it's difficult to discern precisely what kind of authority they have had. Do you know what I mean? With Arsene still in, in place for the second half of the season. I think Miss Lintat's influence is pretty clear when you look at the transfer policy. You look at Aubameyang, you look at Mkhitaryan, and you look at Mavropanos. Yeah, absolutely. But Sanye here, uh, you know, we, we've only heard from him in that fans forum meeting. We don't know how those two have integrated as a pair. We don't know how they work with Gazidis. We don't know how involved or not they are in the appointment process. So it really is... Next season for Arsenal, one of the great exciting things about it is how many unknowns there are. And the main one is about the head coach. But I do think there is this other unknown of how does this entire management structure manage to collaborate? And how do they come together? Because they haven't got a shared path. They haven't got a shared history. It's a new partnership. And uh, it's essential, isn't it, for Arsenal Football Club that they, they make that click and make that happen. It, that's not an easy thing. The magic that Wenger had with, say, David Dean is not commonplace. You know, that sort of relationship is not... You don't find that all the time. Yeah, I mean, they do have a, a big job on their hands to, to work together and to work as a team and to work effectively and, uh, you know, to bring in the new, the new manager, a new head coach. Do you see, Philippe, a big distinction between head coach and manager in terms of what the Very job entails? So. Very much so. And also what I find rather interesting is that they seem to be going towards the uh, strategy of the head coach when most of the other Premier League clubs are going to the strategy of the manager. Mm. Because if you look around, um, well, Mourinho is Mourinho, so we won't talk about Mourinho anymore. No, no, no please. No. We're having a nice night. We're having <laughs> a really nice time. But if you look at Manchester City, um, Pep Guardiola has just signed a new deal for the first time in his life, he's going to stay more than four years, probably, and perhaps more than that, at the same club, shaping almost every aspect of the club strategy in terms of, certainly in terms of the football itself, not in terms of financial and political strategy, which is, um, we, we could talk about that, but we won't talk about it. We're having a nice night. Exactly. Uh, you look at Tottenham, they're desperate to keep Monsieur Pochettino, uh, same thing, there is a football strategy at work here, which has already been there for four years, so we're looking long-term. You're looking at Liverpool, Jurgen Klopp, same thing, long-term strategy, where the, the head guy, the head coach, is very much in charge of the way that the club is going to be run, including transfer, uh, transfers and so forth. Arsenal seems to be going towards people who will be very much employees of the club, coaches rather than managers. So a bit against the grain of what the other clubs are doing in the Premier League, successful clubs. I could actually take, take examples elsewhere in the league, like Shondaj with Burnley. People were there for a long time with a project, and the manager is the person who devises and delivers the project. It seems now we're more going to, okay, we need a head coach to coach the guys, put the team out, but we look after the rest. So, which is one of the reasons why it's so... Imp well, they, we were all on tenterhooks wondering, are we going to get an Arteta type kind of manager? Are we going to get a, an Emery type, an Allegri type, a Sarri type? 
because all of these would be indicative of completely different strategies for the medium and long term. Mm. It does seem like we're getting an Arteta type more than any of the others because I don't know about what you guys think, but to me, all the names that have been out there have been, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced there was that much interest in anyone else beyond Mikel Arteta. Maybe Allegri, if they could have got him, but Patrick Vieira was a name who was mentioned. I'm not sure there was any real contact with Patrick Vieira. We think that there was none. Yeah. Yep. So there are names put out there into the ether to make it look like there's been a, a process or a consultation process or a real thought gone into it when maybe the idea all along has been Mikel Arteta to bring this guy in and to put him into this structure. Is there, is there something to be said, Amy, for that being a positive, that at least it is a clear idea, while you can have reservations about how it might work, given that he's never managed a game, etc., etc., but at least it is a clear idea. But if it was a clear idea, and if they really had that courage of their convictions, you know, did they really need to go through the... Don't, don't, doesn't that become even stronger if you say, this is our guy, and this is why? Mm. Um, I, d I just think that for all that you're saying about the different, you know, the, the shades of grey and the management structures, Philippe, it's quite hard to look beyond the fact that the guy, and he might be absolutely immensely talented and have a huge bright future, but he still hasn't managed a game of football. And, you know, in the end, you can call it head coach all you like, and you can say that your job is just to look after the players on the training field, get them ready for matches and try and win those matches. That's it. We don't want you to have to worry about anything else. But that's not realistic in, in the football world. A head coach, even in that position, someone in charge of that situation still has to manage. They, still, they have to obviously manage the players, and by that I mean manage their personalities, manage their their issues, their problems, their concerns, their fitness, has to manage agents, has to manage us a lot in the media, probably annoying them quite a lot of the time, has to manage expectations from the fan base and the atmosphere and what's going on out there in the, the wider world. You cannot just be a head coach if you are the figurehead and you are in charge of picking the team of a major club. In my but, humble but opinion, you, you could ask Amy. Uh, so I mean, I mean, I mean and it may well be if it is Michael Arteta that he's brilliant at all that managing aspect. You know, let's hope he is. But it's a huge leap of faith because he's never had to do it before. Uh, aren't they just applying a North American model? <laughs> I think <laughs> when so. You go, yeah. When you go to an NFL, you know, which is what the model that Cronker Senior and Cronker Junior would know about. You can get rid of your head coach twice a year if you want to. You've got a guy who's in charge of the draft. You've got a charge who's in charge of statistics. You've got a, charge in, a guy in charge of the defense and the offense and all this. Everything is incredibly compartmented. And it may be that they want to bring this model over to the Premier League and, because they think it works. In which case, having somebody like Mikel Arteta is not going to cost as much money. I think the fans will, would welcome him anyway because he's been one of ours. He's one of ours. You want to give him a, a, fair, a fair crack at the whip, and um, if it doesn't work out, let's just get somebody else. I think that's right. I think I've, I've, called, I've heard the Arsenal model called sort of a continental model, the new model we're adopting, but I think you're right. It's much closer to a North American way of being, and that makes sense. With, that's what the Cronkies know. And I, I've spent the past few days kind of uh, talking myself around <laughs> to Mikel Arteta uh, due to, a, frankly, a lack of alternatives. Um, but I'll be honest, when Amy said then, you know, he hasn't managed a single football match, I felt physically sick. <laughs> like, <laughs> as she said it, I was like, oh, God, that, that's true, isn't it? And it is such an... I, I think he, he managed one, didn't he, when... Oh, that's Pep just a story, isn't it? Oh, that's just a piece on. of shit that they put in the website. Like, he did manage one, and it was against Arsenal, and they won. That's, that's nonsense, surely. Surely. That is, know. yes, you're quite correct. Yeah. Sorry. Also, anyone could beat Arsenal, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's not hard. But I think, yeah, it, there's so much involved in it. Like, you could be a sensational one-to-one -one coach, and there's evidence to suggest Arteta is. Fernandinho has said as much. There's been a lot of talk about Raheem Sterling, his improvement under Arteta. But there is so much more involved, and whatever your job title is, 
you know, it was really interesting watching Thierry Henry's interview about Arsene Wenger when Arsene uh, stepped down. And it was all about the, the side of management that we don't see, dealing with players on a day-to-day basis. How much of a... Was it, did he call himself a pain in the arse, Thierry? A pain in the... Yeah, arse or neck, one or the other. Right, one Either or the way. other. Either can happen. So it's sciatica of some kind. And basically, he, he made that point. And I sort of think, Arteta has never been in that position. And he's never been the front man. I... I desperately want him to do well if it is him, but I must say it's a huge, huge ask. It would be a huge ask of anybody. Uh, and however good he is, he's going to need to be sensational to be a success straight away. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There is a, a level of expectation, isn't there? But he's going to need time. You know, yeah. Philippe, you're talking about, oh, in, the, in America and they can just replace them every, if it doesn't work, whatever. But that's... That goes against the idea. The idea, if you're going for someone like that, is you have to be patient. You have to give that person the time to find out the, the, the manager or head coach that they really are when they're at the sharp end and the decision and the buck stops absolutely with them. You know, he, he's going to need that space. He's going to need patience. He's going to need backup. He's going to need some really good people to work with him on the coaching staff in this kind of situation. And he's going to need the club to turn around and say, you know, we want you because we don't want to have a manager every year or two. We want you because we've come from a 22-year mm. situation and we don't want this one to be over in five minutes. So, I mean, th- there's uh, an onus on the club when they uh, announce this, at whatever point they announce it, to communicate that to fans as well, right? That this is a guy that we believe in and give him that backing, which might win him some time and patience yeah. because it is going to be... It's a tough job because we've seen what happened at, at Manchester United when Ferguson left. Yeah, there is, when you lose a, a, yeah. a big name manager like that, it can have, there, is, a, there is an element of how much lower it can be go. But they were champions. Different. No, I know, I know, I know. They won the, chamber, the, the, the league by a record at the time, what was a record uh, number of points as well. Mm. Even though they were not a very good team at all, they were aging, it was the last of Ferdinand and Vidic and all these people. Um, but you could say that in a way they're following also a German model because you know it's not by chance that we've got you know, Sven and the other guys coming in. Uh, it's the way that, for example, uh, Nagelsmann has made his name. It's the way that Thomas Tuchel made his name. It's the way that Klopp made his name at Mainz. So where they, they started with very very little, little expectations uh, against their name. So you might say that Arsenal. It's not a club like Mainz. Uh, it's not a club like Manchester Gladbach or something like that. It's a much bigger name. Yeah. Possibly. But on the other hand, the model has worked elsewhere. And since there's a kind of Germanization of the club at the moment at every level, you could imagine that it's a mixture of the American model and the German model. And they think, yeah, it can work. What do you think, James, the expectation is for next season? Like, what, what, what is going to be the remit for Mikel Arteta? I is think- it is it get us back into the top four? Yeah, I think it's as simple as that. I think it's to get us back into the Champions League. Ideally via top four, if it has to come via trying to win the Europa League. We've seen that can be not as straightforward as you might imagine. But uh, I, I think that is it. I don't think it's realistic, is it? Whoever comes in, whether it wasn't Arteta, whether it was Allegri or Luis Enrique or anybody else. Arsene said sort of on the way out, I think this with two or three signings, this team could challenge next year. And with I think respect I've, to us, I, I think that he's before. kidding himself. Yeah, I've heard that a few times. <laughs> Might have heard that. With two or three signings, which will not happen. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, and he yeah. never specified where, what those signings were. And, uh, and to, I can't imagine. I mean, if it's Messi and Ronaldo, maybe. But apart from that, I, I don't think it's plausible. Look at the size of the gap from Man City, not just to us, but to pretty much everybody else. And we are not the ones closest to closing that. So for my money... To get us back into the Champions League next season would be actually a, a really big achievement. There's a lot of work to do, Amy, in terms of... Yeah, but you, could, you look at those kind of specific goals that you can sort of see that are real goals, like getting back in the Champions League or trying to win something or this or that. But there's also the other aims that I think would signify improvement. And people can argue the toss about whether that's enough or not. But to not go away from home against big teams and sort of half know what's coming to get any sort of point away from home would be nice to be honest (laughs) you know to go and have a bit of a fight when you go and play away at Chelsea or Man United or Man City despite their great strength or whoever to have West Brom Stoke uh, Mm. mm. yeah yeah you know these are things as well to to be a bit more to to not have those lapses of concentration at the back and just be a bit more organised and a bit more robust I think if those kind of things 
they're not going to happen overnight, but if they can be achieved quite quickly, people will go, ooh. And I think another thing that that I don't think will be explicitly communicated to the manager, but from the owner's point of view, if the new manager can have the stadium full every week, that would be a big thing from their perspective. You know, just re-energising the fan base. That's another one of those kind of nebulous things that probably will be a target in some respect. Just a new season with a new manager, new coaches perhaps that he might bring in, new players, some old players going. You know, there is that to, to get people going as well. I, I, I suppose so, uh, even though, I mean, to, not to put a dampener on things, or actually to put a dampener on things, um, there is not an awful lot of money which is available. Um, so they say. So they say, and so it is probably true, uh, because the opposite hasn't been true for quite a while. Where is all the money? Where's it going? Where's it, where it going to Colorado, man? And, and, uh, <laughs> I think Mazda Herzl's got quite a lot of it. <laughs> and, and then also, um, the, the thing is that there is, not, there is not, nobody I can see who is going to be sold for, I think, a shitload of money is the technical expression. That's the technical expression, yeah. And uh, th- there's nobody around that you can, you know, you don't think, well, okay, even Alexis went for quite a lot of money. Not. Not. No money. <laughs> He went for no money whatsoever. Um, but there are no players around that you can think the club can dispense with and, and get you know, enough money to uh, well, they boost keep, the coffers. There's Aaron Ramsey and Hector Bellerin, whose names keep getting mentioned in that regard. <laughs> to me, like personally, we have to keep those two guys, yes. I think, because yes. they're good and we need more good players. Yes. yes. And also, how much would you get from them? You might get quite a lot for Aaron Ramsey, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Last year of his contract, though. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bellerin, bit of cash, not much. The days when it, you know Bellerin was interesting, Barcelona are long gone. Arteta obviously knows Hector Bellerin very well. Yeah. And he sp- Arteta spoke about Bellerin very early on and said that he was going to be the right back at Arsenal for years and years to come. So it's hard to imagine he'd come in and sanction his sale, especially when we don't have any other right back. The, the problem, I think that we, we would um, agree that a new keeper is needed. Yep. Uh, we certainly need at least one central defender. Mm-hmm. We need a defensive midfielder. Correct. And probably a, a guy who can play on the wings, you know, like a guy who goes past people and crosses the ball. Yeah. Got some skills. I okay. don't know what you're talking about. Then <laughs> we need the money to bring Olivier Giroud back to Arsenal. <laughs> yeah, so that's going to cost a bit. Um, he, looks, he looks terrible in blue, doesn't he? Oh, it just God. doesn't suit him at all. God. So if you're looking at it, we're already talking about, what, four or five players? Mm. What's the going rate for a player of international class in any of those positions? About £600 million. Something like moment. that. So we're looking at a, a massive outlay of money, which is unlikely. Mm. So is the plan, Amy, buy young and promising and hope for the best, stick all those it's, things it's together? Like they, they, they used to do in Real Madrid a team of Zidane's and Pavones. Mm. Yeah. So you have Maitland-Niles. We'd like to see more of Maitland-Niles, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. they see that, for example. Yeah. That's a start. Yeah. Edin Ketia. Sorry, well, uh, I'll just <laughs> it off for a second now. What was the question? We were just talking about you know buying in young players, or or perhaps perhaps one of the things uh, that the new manager will be asked to do, given that uh, our esteemed chief executive spoke so uh, fondly about the values of the club and bringing through young players, will be to to try and develop the crop of young players who are at the club right now. Look, I think that you know. Any club with any sense tries to buy the best young players they can. I mean, it's not rocket science. This is not something all of a sudden that's new and innovative and brilliant. If you find a, you know, a kid of whether it's you know, 18, 20 or, or younger and you, you really think that, they, that in the right environment and with the right coaching and, uh, that they're going to flourish, well, of course you want to you buy them in before they're unbuyable. I mean, we all know the, the litany of players that you know, supposedly nearly came to Arsenal mm. um, when they were young and affordable. For one reason, it, do, it doesn't happen. And then they, they go somewhere else and then suddenly, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo is obviously way out of reach. I mean, football is full of these things. Um, but <laughs> it's something that is, you know, has served Arsenal brilliantly. I mean, we all remember the very, you know, the early... Vangie is seeing Nicholas Anelka at the age of 17, you know, one of his first signings. 
by Jesus, that kid was unreal. Mm. We'd never seen anything like... The Premier League had not seen a player like Nicholas Anelka when he first arrived in... in uh, Whatever it was, 1997. Or something yeah, like and that. remember, Amy, the first time we saw Cesc Fabregas, Carling Cup game at, at Highbury. Rotherham? Was it? Rotherham, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And um, I think you told me on that day that they. No, no, Amy did. I don't did. remember what I did yet. <laughs> and they, they, had done the, they had done the stats analysis on Prozone, and he had come up with, he was, what, 17 at the time? with the most astonishing figures they'd ever seen for a player of that age at, at any stage. And you know, he proved to be a, yeah. a wonderful player for what us. What we should do is get the guy who found those players. He sounds like he can spot <laughs> talent. But I think when you, when you, the, the whole point about Sven Mislintat is that that's supposed to be his, his clever thing, is finding the guys just before they're going to be brilliant. That was his Never kind of calling card. Good. Exactly. But again, if you're going to do that, if you're going to give the keys to the team to you know, some young players. As you say, there's a, a number of positions that need to be addressed. And if, you, if most of those are going to be filled with, assuming it's not another 29-year-old from Borussia Dortmund, um, somebody who's, who's young and got loads of promise, they need time. So I'm, I'm very interested in the messaging that comes out when the new man is, is unveiled and whether or not that's part of, of the whole message that comes across. Because... It does need for everybody to buy into it, for the bums to come back on the seats, mm. for the atmosphere to be, you know, engaged again. It's, some managers can do that. I mean, Sarri has done it with Naples. Because to be honest, you look at the players, I mean, he, they've been one of the most wonderful teams to watch last season. They've been absolutely fabulous. You look at the team, it's honestly nothing to shout about. Honestly, it's not that great. But you've got one of those guys who is capable to transform them. Um, and, but, but if you're looking at young players whom you know have got the quality to, to, to succeed in the Premier League, you're looking at players like Leon Bailey, for example. And how much is Leon Bailey worth today? 80 million, something like that? Probably. That's after one season where he's basically exploded in the Bundesliga, which is where they're looking for all their players. Mm. So, you know, you, you would like to be confident, but a bit like Amy, I'm not too sure. I think we're all a little bit cautiously optimistic, might be. That, that's that's one way of putting it. With the on the cautious, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, look, what we're going to do is take a little break. That's part one. Uh, you guys can go get a drink at the bar. We're going to come back with part two, and we're going to have questions. We'll open it up to the floor. So we'll be back in about 15 minutes. Thank you, questions, guys. Cheers. Hello. Guys, um, you've all got Twitter, so you probably know this before us. But uh, someone just came up on the stage and pointed out that David Ornstein, a.k.a. The Ornacle, has announced or, or said that the unanimous decision as to the identity of the Arsenal manager has been made, and it is not Mikel Arteta. <laughs> nope. But Unai Emery. Yes. Well, that went down really well. <laughs> <laughs> and there were the welcoming cheers. Of the so, <laughs> we'll be re-recording the first part of the podcast. Yeah, Oscars you can forget about the fucking so, just ruined that first Some of you might want to rethink your questions. Or This is what happens when you do stuff live, guys. Things happen. Hello again. Just like to take uh, this opportunity to... Thank David Ornstein and Arsenal for, for ruining the first half of that podcast. But there you go. Football is full of uh, surprises. Unai Emery, James, at least he's managed a game of football. Yeah. <laughs> There's that. There is that. I, I mean, do you feel less sick now? I always feel a little bit sick, Andrew. You know that very well. But I... I, um, <laughs> I, I I am relatively positive about it, actually. But only because, I, I confess, I'm no Unai Emery expert, but this morning when I saw the stories linking with the job, I took them very much with a pink pinch of salt at that point. But I did think, well, let's have a look at this guy, let's have a look at his track record. And when you go back and you look at what he's done, the clubs he's managed, there is a comparison to be drawn, maybe, with Arsenal in their position now. He was at Valencia 
And I think he finished uh, third three seasons consecutively with Valencia, which when you've got Real Madrid and Barcelona there at that time, is basically best of the rest. Not too shabby. It's second first. Exactly. Uh, then he... It's the new fourth place trophy. <laughs> <laughs> so get excited about that, guys. Uh, and then he went to Russia and I think it, it didn't work out for him well there. But he came back to Sevilla and working in a structure there not dissimilar to the kind of structure we've been talking about at Arsenal. He was working with, I believe it's Monchi, who's the guy with who Monchi, yeah. identifies a lot of their talent. And had considerable success there. He won three consecutive Europa Leagues. Uh, didn't sort of push on significantly in the Champions League beyond that point, hence continually you know, being in that Europa League cycle. But uh, he has got a track record of silverware. And then, uh, as Philippe will, I'm sure, be able to tell us, most recently in France, he'd lost his job this year, but he, he left his job with a few medals in his pocket. Yeah. It, you know, he's won the title at PSG, which is quite the achievement. <laughs> Astonishing. Um, that's one thing he's got in common with Brendan, I think. <laughs> yeah. It's like if you don't do a treble, yeah. you've failed. And, uh, but he hasn't failed. So why did he leave his job with PSG? He, thank you very much. <laughs> Whoever you are, uh, he was sacked. Uh, he was sacked because for PSG, it's all about the Champions League mm. and it went pear-shaped. Yet again, um, that's probably Unai. That's, no, that's my... F oh, it is. It's Unai Amara. Yeah. It's Unai. It's Mikel Arteta. He's going fucking crazy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> you should see what he's just texted <laughs> Andrew here. My goodness. Um, well, he... He failed. Um, up to a point. Uh, you've got to remember that um, they were very close to this extraordinary result against Barcelona mm. and things like that. Um... You must remember that um, PSG is a funny club, <laughs> or funny or not so funny, where basically everything is going to be judged by the Champions League. Yeah. And since they failed again this year, he was on his way out and has been the way of others before him, like Laurent Blanc, Carlo Ancelotti, and Antoine Comboire. You know, everybody fails at PSG. Uh, on the other hand, very interestingly, he gave an interview with us after he was sacked, in which he explained the reasons for his failure at PSG. And I thought that was quite brave of him, to be honest. He spilled the beans a bit. And also quite revealing of his personality. Because he's very much a disciplinarian. Okay, he's a, somebody who organizes his teams tactically. Uh, is very demanding. Uh, demands from his players complete concentration, focus physically, mentally and so forth. And with PSG, he said, I arrived and I had half of the dressing room willing to do this kind of effort and half of the dressing room which was not. So basically, his Neymar and his chums were not right. willing to do any of this stupid thing like organizing Team himself. Teamwork. Teamwork. <laughs> Who needs any what? Yeah. Teamwork. Um, organizing yourself defensively, working on tactical systems. And he said, that's basically the reason why you haven't seen the PSG I was hoping to see. So he's going to be in a very different situation if it in indeed it is he because... What now? Anything? I, I mean, they're I going to ruin know. the second half of the podcast as well? Uh, possibly. Um, Fuck. But on the other hand, uh, as you know, James said, he's got a proven track record as, as a winner, mm -hmm. serial winner. In Spain, people have said that he didn't quite have it to cut it in the Liga when he was with Sevilla, that perhaps he didn't achieve as much as he should have with the group of players he had. On the other hand, you can't fold the record in knockout competition in Europe. Mm. So um, I, I think it's a pretty interesting and exciting signing. Don't you think? I think so. I think, I mean, one of my concerns about Arteta was that it didn't feel like the cleanest break, you know. And this is a, a completely new voice coming into the club. And I, and I, I think that's a positive thing, yeah. I mean, in terms of, uh, by the way, Arteta and Unai Emery have got something in common, which is the hair. Mm. Oh, yeah? The amount of time they spend on their hair, the amount of oil they put on it is absolutely phenomenal. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm we would not know anything about that, Philippe, in <laughs> fairness. Nobody up here. Well, look, we'll see what happens. It's, um, it's a bolt from the blue. Um, maybe a more sensible appointment than somebody who's never managed, Amy? Do you think that was... That was part of it in that, like, if you, if you are 
bold and brave and you appoint Mikel Arteta, you don't have any kind of a safety net when you make that decision. Whereas if you bring in somebody with a track record of actually managing a game of football and also success, you can, if it doesn't work, you can say, well, look, at least we, we brought in a guy who was experienced and who's won things. Do you think that was a consideration? I'm just sitting here trying to digest the fact that I've written a massive piece about Mikel Arteta being an Arsenal manager. <laughs> which was commissioned last week by The Guardian, uh, along with several other articles, uh, uh, with different aspects of new Arsenal manager Mikel Arteta, which are obviously... Um, I'm not sure it's a cut and paste job, really. But, uh, <laughs> so, Find and so, replace. Anyway, sorry, I, I, I digress. Um, yeah, I think that... I mean, it's interesting because uh, when the Arteta rumours became very strong, um, you know, the, the main... I think it was obvious that the, the thing that was very difficult to get over was the not managing a game of football before. With the, the, you know, I read a piece the other day, someone said about what is experience? You know, how do you gain... You know, what does it mean? How do you... And <laughs> what Philippe just said about one of Emery's strengths... Um, being disciplined, being, you know, this trying to instill these tactical ideas and demanding of his players and all this kind of stuff. In many ways, the dressing room that he's walking into, that's what, that's exactly what they need. Whether he's yeah. the right man to be delivering that message remains to be seen. But they're crying out for a guy to tell them exactly what to do, um, to get hold, you know, to make them feel confident defensively that they can be robust and not a bit panicky and not maybe losing concentration to make them feel that they have a plan that they can enact on a difficult pitch and try and get a result and I think that they're they're going to be so receptive to a new voice whose whose strengths is that it is absolutely a clean slate now for everybody isn't it because Arteta even if he was going to come in and be ruthless and you know, put himself in the position of manager and not former teammate. Yeah. He knew a lot about the players, or most of the players that were there, whereas Emery will know some of them obviously by reputation, but he's got to come in and make a, an assessment and a judgment of, of these players yes. by working with them. And he's, um, he's very precise in his preparations, and you can be sure he's one of those guys who has dossiers on absolutely everything. Um, and I, I would say, if you want to have an idea of what, what he's like as a manager, I would um, tell you to watch, I think it was the first leg of the tie against Real Madrid. In France, he was absolutely slated for a couple of changes he made, where Zidane basically made some changes which were d decisive. What people forget is that when Unai Emery changed his team, this is actually when they had the best 20 minutes <laughs> in the Champions League this season, he was able to take the decision. He could see what was going on, and suddenly PSG were all over Real Madrid and actually making them look absolutely ridiculous. And it's only because of a couple of, of perhaps lack of focus. Again, the players were not hadn't bought into his own eth ethos that PSG got undone. But he's very smart, very hardworking. And as to the fact that he doesn't speak very good English, may I remind you that uh, another manager, a uh, Spanish-speaking manager who works in a club which is, you know, didn't speak a word of English, more or less, when he arrived in, in England and hasn't done too badly since then. Carvajal just got sacked by Swansea. <laughs> I'm joking. Yes. I'm joking. Well, look, will we, will we do some questions, or do you want to... Yeah, I just the only, only other thing that's interesting. We were talking in the in the uh, famous first half of this podcast that may or may never be broadcast um, <laughs> uh, about the, the the three men brought together to make this decision. And I think that you know we all made these big. I'm guilty here, here by the way. Uh, big uh, judgments and assessments based on you know if Mikel Arteta is the guy that they come to when you've got uh, Ivan Gazidis trying to flex a little bit of muscle um, as chief executive. You've got Raul Sanelli, who's come in with his contacts in his Barcelona background, uh, and uh, Sven Mislintat with his contacts in Germany. You know, I, I was a bit like, wow, you know, like if you're going to make this decision, surely Ivan Gazidis is going to do a bit of listening to these guys, because they've been out working on the kind of football coalface, if you like. Um, involved in these kind of decisions in the past. And then you think, hmm, Arteta. But Arteta seemed to be a Gazidis choice uh, because of the rapport they had uh, at the club previously. 
because Gazidis, it was easy to come to the conclusion that he was maybe drawn to this as an idea, as to be, this is going to be my discovery. You know, this is the guy, I've seen something in him. Mm. So after all that thought process, if, if they end up coming with, up with a completely different plan, then all my preconceptions are just bollocks. So it's quite interesting <laughs> that you, you, you realise that perhaps the three of them, they've sat down together and they're not necessarily doing things exactly as we'd imagined. Right. Well, maybe it speaks to somebody being able to turn around and say, this is not a good idea, you know. Maybe this isn't the best appointment we can make, so we'll see. It's, it's mad, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, this whole managerial appointment process, uh, as fans, we've really been pretty much in the dark. You know, there's, there's been all these kind of false leads and Allegri, all the talk about Allegri, and all the talk about Arteta, and then this has come in the last 24 hours from nowhere. But then when you think about it, that is a bit of an Arsenal trademark, isn't it? An appointment from the blue. That's not necessarily something new. Apparently, you only arrived in London last night, as well as right. I'm told. Do, do you think they'll put Mikel Arteta in charge of the Man City Arsenal game again next? <laughs> <laughs> that will be interesting. Mm, yeah, I doubt it. Of motivation. I doubt it. Will we do questions, James? We'll do questions, yeah. Let's we've, do it. We've got a radio mic there. Let's just check it's on. Oh, it is on. Oh, Exciting. It is on. Brilliant. No wires. Okay. So what we'll do, you guys stick your hands up. I'll come to you. Tell us your name and your question. Um, fire away. We'll start in the front row, because these guys got here early doors. I think it's fair. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that I kind of, I'm not surprised that we haven't gone for Arteta, if that is the case, because I always felt that if, Gazidis, if it's Gazidis choice and he puts in Arteta and it doesn't work out, then it really puts the pressure on him. But if you put in somebody that's tried and tested, then, you know, well... You know, it's a logical choice. You know, it didn't work out. I'll move on to the next one. So preservation a little. A little bit, yeah. So I kind of, I'm not, so I just, in the back of my head, I just well, wasn't quite sure it was going to be Arteta as strong as it looked. Yeah. My question is, um, apart from sort out the defence, what one thing on or off the field would you do if you were Arsenal manager? The, w the only one thing. You could or the most important thing? The, the most important thing. Like, I think I, I wrote something on the blog the other day about Mikel Arteta installing a bit of bastardosity into the team again. And I know it's one of those great intangibles that you can't quantify in any way, but just a slight change of culture, less niceness. Keonitis. Keonitis, yeah, perhaps. Yes. Perhaps. A bit, more, a bit more Laurenitis. Like, yes. you know, think about, close your eyes and just think about that moment when Cristiano Ronaldo is bombing down the wing at Highbury and Lauren sends him spiraling into the air like a satellite. And he lands on the, you know, you don't want to see a guy hurt that badly or anything. I just mean, you know, that kind of uncompromising attitude to to our players and the way that we approach games. Obviously, there are personnel issues, there are tactical issues, there are organizational and disciplinary issues, but I'd just like to see a bit more... Discipline frimpongicity. That, no, not, not, no, no, not less that. frimpong, no. no definitely, frimpong. Not, definitely not frimpong. Well, Xhaka tries, from, but he, you know, he, gets, he gets sent off and stuff um, when he does it. Um, but just that, you know, a change of culture slightly, you know? That's what I think. Vice, I believe it's called. Bit of vice. Bit of vice. A bit of vice. Miami vice. Yes, something yeah. like that. Don Johnson for manager. Okay. Anything you would do in I think, particular? I think, uh, uh, I think you've summed it up pretty well. Okay. All right. Okay, next question. Let's see a uh, hand somewhere here. This guy, let's go over here. Hey man, what's your name and what is your question? Hi, uh, my name is Pav. Um, first question, do I get a refund for the first half of this podcast? Absolutely. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Uh, what are the top three things you guys are excited about about the next season? Top three things to be excited about? Amy, I'll let you go first. Sounds Having to write that piece again? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, just something new. Just even if there are things that go wrong and things that are uh, a bit disappointing, it's going to be a different kind of wrong or a different kind of 
disappointing. I think it's just the fact that there's going to be a new chapter that nobody knows what what the themes are. You know, who, we're really... Uh, I, I think there is an excitement now that feels, you know, maybe slightly different to potentially if it was Arteta, where I think there was a bit more... When you talked in the first half about cautious optimism. People weren't quite sure that they could really get excited or behind this this thing because it just seemed like such a shot in the dark. Whereas, obviously, any managerial appointment comes with risk. It doesn't matter who it is. And you just want to see... Um, look, the guy went to Spartak Moscow. It didn't work. Every managerial choice, it can be a, a great marriage, it can be a not bad marriage, or it can be really rocky and really awful. And you want to see that this man and Arsenal click and there's something going on there. I think that's the first thing to be excited about, that the, the idea that something new is coming and that, that, that it clicks quickly. I'd say myself to see some of the younger players being able to blossom in an environment that is more disciplined and more defined, certainly tactically speaking, mm. because um, uh, something that you'll hear almost a, 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 any, any pro who is over the age of 28 or 29 talk about is the way that the new generation of professional footballers relate to their own job and how they, are, um, they depend on very strong guidance on the field far more than perhaps generations before them. And I'm thinking, and there are a few players like this at Arsenal. I mean, I, I mentioned Maitland Niles. I really have a, a very weak spot for him because I genuinely thought the first time I saw him, this guy's got something. Same thing for Mavropanos. I think we've seen him a couple of times. He got sent off beautifully. Welcome to Arsenal, young Absolutely. man. Absolutely. Um, and you think, actually, with the right kind, in the right kind of environment, these are players who could really show us something. So things to be excited about, perhaps a manager, if indeed it is Unai Emery, who is perhaps better tuned or attuned to the needs of a younger generation of very talented players, which you've already got. The other thing that's exciting, and I think we've seen glimpses of it already, is you know, the, the potential within the attacking combination that is still very new to the club. When you have Aubameyang and Lacazette and Meza Ozil and Mkhitaryan um, all together, we've it, 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 there were these little flashes and glimpses of something happening there. And with a new uh, tactical idea behind it, I think potentially that could be very exciting. James, anything in particular exciting? Yeah, here? Amy mentioned it there, but I think Aubameyang is a huge reason to be excited yeah. for next season. I can't wait to see how he does in games that mean something. <laughs> when he's effect, you know, his numbers are amazing this season. I think it's 10 goals, isn't it? And like 14 appearances, 13 appearances. So yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do. If the man, new manager looks to combine him and Lacazette, which one he'll choose out of those two, how that will play out. But I think he, he made a fantastic start. And essentially he's had like a six month pre-season gearing up for next year. And i He's really hit the ground running, so I'm excited to see what he can bring. Can I add to that the fact, and it's not a detail, that three of the major players for Arsenal next season will not go to the World Cup. Mm. It's not a moot point. Mkhitaryan, Lacazette, Aubameyang will be rested and mm. fresh, unlike most of the guys from the other big teams. And there's a real chance here. I mean, honestly, I'm not, I'm not joking. There's a real chance here. You've got to start the season really full, full on. Pre-season tour is going to be awesome. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, Dublin, I believe. So on it. Woo. Everybody come to Ireland. We'll have a drink or two. <laughs> cool. Hi, man. What's your name? And what's your question? Hi, I'm Ishmael. Um, every season before the season starts, we sit down. There's about four of us here. And we decide what position we finish and we have a little wager did nothing on it i just want to ask the panel individually where do they think we will finish uh, and that will impact because the last 10 minutes we found out somebody's new we for uh, your record we i've said three my dave said four and terry said six so um <laughs> typical terry <laughs> such a negative negative nancy <laughs> um where are we going to finish? I, I think that there is the potential within this group of players if you add the right, the right components, if we can uh, strengthen ourselves defensively. I mean, our home form suggests that there's more to this team than we've seen 
this season. The away form has been terrible. So with tactical organization, discipline, all those things that our, our new friend, Unai Emery, is going to bring. Uh, we think. Uh, we think. We hope. Um, Just wait for the next message. Thing. Fourth. It's fourth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll vote for that. Okay. I'll vote for that. Um, a lot will depend on the way the Europa League is treated and obviously the recruitment. I mean, to make any kind of prediction anyway is a bit silly at this point. But provided not only that we recruit the right mm. players, but also get rid of the ones that we should get rid of, um, I can see that happening. Why right. not? Who do, who do you think we should get rid of? <clears throat> I now, look, you brought cruel. it up. I want to be cruel, but no, I think that um, certainly in central defense, there's at least one player that, honestly. <clears throat> yep. 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 I think so. I think so Amy, too. where are we going to finish? I, I, I hate to be a classic sit on the fence. Don't be a person. Terry. Um, <laughs> I just think it's too early to, to, yeah. to have an educated judgment, to be honest. I think the week before the season starts, you can usually be a lot clearer. And it'll be a slightly more interesting. Even then, it's been difficult to do that because, of course, the transfer window historically has been open till the end of August. But I think this season is the first one August where it's supposed ninth. to finish before the start of the league. So I think we'll all know what we've got to work with then. Um, the only thing I would say is I, I get a bit um, frustrated sometimes with, with the fixation with the top four, uh, simply because I think there are now an, six teams who are entitled to go into every season thinking they should have a jolly good stab at it. And the simple maths tells you that two of them are going to be disappointed. And I think, apart from Man City at the moment, who so obviously would justifiably see it as some kind of divine right to be there at the moment everybody else it's three from five and it, 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 you know trying to predict at this stage who those three are going to be is tricky because we just have to see how things are panning out in each individual season of each mm. club particularly and I, for I, the I really wouldn't want to guess particularly for the North London neighbours who are having going to have to very very tricky summer to, to negotiate yeah, when Pochettino leaves and when Mourinho, uh, you know, goes to war with the squad and they, you know, yeah. tie him up and put him in a car boot and, and push him off a cliff, we, you know, we could take advantage of that. We, we could do that. Yeah. Yes. I and hope they film it, by the way. From the inside. Oh, yeah. With yeah, a multi- GoPro camera. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. With sound on. I want to hear the screams. <laughs> James, where are we going to finish next season? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, if, next if I, question. Yeah, next question. I've got no idea. I'm going right over in the corner. Okay, hey man, what's your name? What's your question? Uh, my name's Sam. Um, some more breaking Arsenal Twitter news. Oh, uh, no. They've been getting serious with squad numbers this evening. Um, a few updates. Petr Cech is the new number one. Hector Bellerin's the new number two. And uh, we have a new number four, which is Mohamed El Nenny. Andrew uh, kept, kept, kept writing. <laughs> Andrew uh, Allen's here. <laughs> but <laughs> Got to get our splug news. Speci- Shirt number stories, Andrew, they're gold. S- specifically about um, the number one, do you think Petr Cech taking that number on, does that change uh, any plans you may have for a goalkeeper this summer? <sighs> Look, I think that it's I- impossible to imagine a situation that um, the structure of, we've been talking about, of recruitment has not been discussing the goalkeeping situation. And I would be surprised if the new incoming manager stroke head coach has also not got a view on this. Uh, I think it will, it's hard to see that it's any, in any way logical for Arsenal to go into the next campaign with the same two main goalkeepers. Um, it's unlikely that you would get two new goalkeepers in. So I think it's, it makes sense that there is a vacancy. Um, if Petr Cech's got the number one, that would suggest that perhaps David Ospina will be moving on. I, I mean, if you were to ask me to choose which one to keep from the two... <laughs> Go on. I, I I'm would, asking you, which one would you keep of the two? Petr Cech. Yes. Because I think if we are bringing in a, a new goalkeeper, perhaps it might be somebody who fits into that profile we spoke about before, where it's a young player with potential, and Czech is obviously vastly experienced. Uh, he's, he's tall, he's got arms that work, you know. And those are important qualities for, for a goalkeeper. So, if, I, if, I, 
if a new guy is going to come in and learn from one of them, I would prefer to it to be... How to make his arms work, for Yeah, example. you know, like... Do this. Do that. Yeah. Don't stand behind the line and stuff, you know. <laughs> Incidentally, just one of those kind of football sliding doors moments, you wonder if all this change had happened a year ago rather than now, whether Wojciech Szczesny might have been persuaded to... Oh, don't even talk uh, about oh. it, Amy. It's too upsetting. We, we, we could actually also talk. I mean, I mean I personally, I, I, I mean, Lukas Fabianski, whom I think has had an absolutely fantastic season with Swansea, despite the fact that they've been relegated. It's been mm. absolutely superb, but there you go. Never go back. But, uh, but Hector Bellerin is the new Lee Dixon. Is that right, Hector Bellerin? Yeah, Hector Bellerin's wearing number two. Yeah. yeah. Number four for Mohamed El Neni. I mean, that's a hell of a promotion for him. Number four is a the historic new number. Yeah, the new Vieira. The new, well, the new Vieira. The Egyptian Vieira. It's what we've all wanted for so long. <laughs> the Egyptian Vieira. He's been absolutely terrific. He has say, to be so. Fun. I'm yeah. a fan. I'm a fan of Mohamed El Neni, and I think we've missed him when he hasn't been playing tremendously. But there you go. I think he's a very good squad player to have. I think he really is a, a good and option. Best of luck to him to be fit for the World Cup. Yep. Yep. For sure. You just wonder with the goalkeeper, if, if what we're sort of supposing is correct and we don't have that much money to spend, are there other areas of the squad, say centre-half or central midfield, that are that much more urgent that they might put the goalkeeper situation on the back burner a bit this summer? Or do you think they have to do something about it? Well, I mean, I guess one of the other factors in this is that there is going to be a new goalkeeping coach because... Um, uh, Jerry Payton is part of Arson's uh, uh, backroom team and he's been let go. So, you know, maybe that's an area through which um, we could see an improvement in the goalkeeping as well. Jens as a goalkeeping coach, perhaps? Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's an obvious thing to, to propose. Um, and I, I'd be surprised if Jens was not very much involved next season. I do recall when I went to speak to Jens at... Uh, I had a write in the book about the Invincibles, um, talking to him, and he was adamant he didn't want to be a goalkeeping coach. He absolutely wanted to be a manager. Um, now, that was a, a few years ago, so it may be that his position has changed slightly, but he couldn't have been more strong in his idea of the way he wanted to see his career off the pitch go, and he, he was completely convinced that he, he didn't want to be a goalkeeping coach at that point. So if that changes, then he's obviously had a, had a big rethink. Hmm. Next question. Oh, here we are. One out here. Da, da, da. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. This is Ed. So firstly, I just hope whoever comes in teaches uh, the guys to give Harry Kane and Deli Alley a real reason to hit the deck. But that's <laughs> another thing. But my actual question is, so with regards to Aaron Ramsey... I suspect we could probably get at least 50 million for him. Do we try and give him the sort of money that Ozil was on or do we entrust um, the new panel to find free gems that can maybe push us to that next level that we could potentially sell on for big money or can take us to Champions League or whatever it may be? I think that's a, a, a brilliant question and that's probably, you know, in as much as this appointment is giving us big clues into how the new panel is making their decisions... Um, that kind of um, decision making as well is going to be a real indicator into how they want to to run the club um, Ram Ramsey in the last few months of the season was superb um, really the kind of football that you you know he he has been a, a player in the past who has sometimes divided the fan base a bit, but on that kind of form there 's no question. Um, but there's also got to be a willingness on his part. Uh, all the players who are in that stage where they reach the last year or so of their contract, the feeling's got to be mutual. You know, the club might want to keep someone and might fight to keep someone. But if Aaron Ramsey decided after this amount of time that he wanted to take that one chance to experience something different, I don't think anybody would begrudge him. So he may not be for convincing. However, if he can be, then it's exactly that decision. Have we got three younger players that we think are going to be superstars and we need that 50 million to spend on them now while they're 18 stroke 19 years of age or do we keep one of the stellar players of, of recent months and and we'll learn a lot from that decision i think yeah i mean i think midfield is an area that has been a, a 
problem f- for a couple of years where the balance has not been right and also the formation yeah is probably not the one that is ideal for a player like Ramsey um, when you look when has he been absolutely amazing it's been with Wales actually um, in in a completely different setup and with Arsenal we see him at from time to time and when he's at his best you genuinely think the team should be built around that guy he's, he's got something the others haven't got He's got a sense of goal that the others haven't got. He's, he drives like others don't do. He's also incredibly indisciplined. And you wonder, which is my question, because I would answer the question with a question, is there something in Ramsey that is worth persevering with in terms of discipline on the field? Because he's a liability. Personal opinion, but you right. might not share it. Um, is... I, I still don't know what his best position is, which is a, a typical Arsenal question, isn't it? Mm. And uh, do you play him as part of a two in a four-two-three-one, and then you decide basically you're not playing to four-two-three-one. You just have got one guy who is there in front of the back four, and good luck to him. Mm. Do you play him as a number ten? And if you play him as a number ten, what do you do with Mesut Ozil? Mm. You put him on the left. He's probably sick, though. Anyway, Mesut. Probably, or he's got a back problem, or he's got a tattoo, which is, you know, is not healing properly. Um, so there are all these questions around him, and it's, 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 but it's you know, the arsenal of the last, what, five, six, seven years. Mm. Tantalizing, but you don't have an answer to that. Yeah, I do wonder. But you wouldn't get 50 million for him, by the way. You wouldn't. One year on his contract, you wouldn't. Mm. I just wonder maybe if. Who is the going situation? to buy Aaron Ramsey for 50 million? Question. Who I don't would, know. Well, exactly. Would one of the big clubs in, in England buy him for 50 million when he's got one year left on his contract? Mm. I think his fitness counts against him in that respect. You know, he's, what is he, 27, something like that? But he's, gonna, he's got those hamstring problems. Yep. That might make someone a bit cautious about investing that level of money. Yeah. It's a tricky one because Ars- arguably Arsenal's two best midfield players are Aaron Ramsey and Mesut Ozil. But they both have kind of a, a cost to them as well. Sort of what Philippe's saying about Ramsey being a little bit structurally of a liability. Ozil's kind of the same to an extent. You know, he requires a certain degree of freedom. So it, when the new manager comes in, if the problem with the midfield is the shape and the structure, maybe you have to dispense with some of those personnel in order to introduce that. Mm. I do wonder as well, maybe if the, the Jack Wilshire situation, the fact that he's now set to sign a contract when it seemed for a while that he wasn't going to sign a contract or the terms weren't agreeable to him, whether new terms that were more agreeable to him were made on the basis that um, they're aware of what Ramsey might want to do or what his situation might be this, this summer. As you say, there's got to be a willingness on the part of the player to, to sign a new deal, you know? Yeah, and I mean, I, I, we'd all love to be that fly on the wall of the conversations that have gone on or would be ongoing between... Uh, the panel has your man over there brilliantly called them and and the new manager and in that sense if they're going through the squad and are they having these conversations what would we do with this particular guy you know it's very obvious to turn around and talk about the ones that you might want to bring in if you can afford them and the ones that you'd maybe like to lose if you can get rid of them but it's those there's ones where you can't, you know, can't so easily make a clear decision. You know, who is going to make that call, for example, on whether it's Aaron Ramsey stays with a big contract or whether it's trying to cash in? Mm. Is that going to be the new manager? Is that going to be Raul Sanelli or, or Gazidis or, or a combination of? It's, com- it's quite complex stuff um, because they've got to try and weigh up what they've got, what they might get. Can they actually get the person they might be trying to get as well? And all these things are fluid. So it's really not easy. Yeah, that's a good point because, I mean, they might have an idea of what um, someone wanted to do with this new guy coming in. Surely he's going to dictate which players he would like to keep. Mm -hmm. Like if he says, "Uh, we've got to keep Aaron Ramsey because he's a great player, then maybe that just changes the whole dynamic. So... We'll see. We'll see. Any questions right at the back here? I've been to that clock over here. Cool. Hey, man, what's your question? Hey, uh, I'm Vanig. Uh, thank you for everything. Thing is, my question is, now that seemingly, seemingly we have Unai Emery on board, are we in that much of a mess? This guy had unlimited resources at PSG, and if we offer him the kind of money, like the 50 million which is on board, that wouldn't get the right thumb of Neymar 
would he want to join? Are we in that much of a mess? Especially you mentioned we have Aubameyang, Ozil, Lacazette, even Xhaka I consider a great player. So that's my question. Um, James, you go first. <laughs> Are we in a mess? Yeah, I mean, I guess we are in a mess. We're always in a, a, a little bit of a mess. Uh, as relates to Emery, though, and, and PSG and the money he had available, I think you have to look at that as a relatively unique case within his career. I think you have to look more at Valencia and Sevilla and his track record at those clubs when you look at how he's going to operate at Arsenal because he's not... No, he's no longer with the club where he's got the most wealth in the league. This isn't a PSG situation. And if anything, that has seemed to suit him better in the past. So I, I think, I don't think you can argue with the calibre of the appointment, really. I think it's on paper, on paper, it, it looks like a strong choice. But, you know, these things are, it's all about chemistry. It's about how he clicks with the club. And it's almost impossible to predict. It's not Unai Emery who decided to sign Neymar or to sign Kylian Mbappe. Let's put it that way. True. And the weird thing about the Arteta situation is the first lines that have come out about it since the news about Emery have suggested that it maybe it broke down over him wanting more say in transfers. Now, obviously, that's speculation at this stage, but perhaps Emery is more malleable in that respect, more willing to buy into this kind of structure. Mm. Yeah, I think, I mean, the crux of the question is, are things really that bad if we're appointing a manager who's had success, and we do have some good players and p attacking potential. So could be worse, no? Didn't it? Could be worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could be worse. And also, is is a guy who is not um, a kind of fanatical thinker in terms of tactics, as in my system is this and that. And no, he tends to work the mm. way he organizes the team according to the qualities, individual qualities of the individual as, at his disposal, and not the other way around. So. Mm. Nothing to say about that. Nothing bad to say about that. Cool. Any questions over this side? Ah, uh, Tayo, how you doing, man? Oh, yeah, good. Hello, I'm Tayo. Um, just a question to our esteemed members of the Fourth Estate there, more than anything. <laughs> you're, uh, you've been on the Arsenal beat. Well, you've been on the press beat for as long as you have, and you're obviously Arsenal fans. I just want to ask you what it's like as Arsenal fans and members of the press at some of the... Uh, some of the treatment of, uh, well, I was going to say the boss, but the artist formerly known as the boss. Uh, I was going to ask what it's like being a, member, a journalist as well as an Arsenal fan. And I mean, most football fans always believe that everyone's against their own team, of course. But Arsene Wenger always did seem to put up with a lot more and be a soft target for around some of your colleagues. I just wondered what it was like as, uh, as I say, members of the press, but also obviously Arsenal fans. Well, this one's, this one's for you because I'm just a bloke with a website. <laughs> it's, you know, sometimes you meet people, I mean, uh, it's not exactly top secret in my case, but it, uh, uh, other journalists, uh, you know, people go, oh, who do you support, who do you support? And I've heard, you know, um, fans sometimes kind of accuse people of supporting this team or that or take, a, take some kind of position on it. And I've also heard some journalists kind of deny that they ever supported a club, which has always struck me as a little bit odd because, you know, we're here doing this job because we absolutely love football. And it's quite odd to imagine we, we, a situation where... We'll give the names where, at the bar later on when the yeah. stuff is being recorded. <laughs> it, it, it's hard to imagine someone growing up um, and being desperate to work in football so much but never having supported anybody because it's kind of part of your rite of passage of getting into football is that you... You, you support a club, you love them, you want to go and watch them, you want to analyse them, you, you, you feel everything that's going on in, inside you. Um, I, when you're covering a club, it's like, it's, it sounds really... Tony Adams always used to say this, he used to go, it's a job. And he used to think, it's Tony Adams, he's the Arsenal captain, what are you talking about? And he was quite strong about this. He had, you know, he had himself, and then being a footballer, was, that was his job, and it was quite difficult to fathom because he seemed like so much more than that. But that separation is quite important. So when you go to work, you have to go to work and you have to try and separate what you might be feeling from what you've got to do. Uh, so that's kind of how I personally try and deal with... Um,
Well, <coughs> one thing which should be remembered, it's not just valid for us and it's valid for other managers as well, is that the English press was more or less controlled from Carrington, i.e. Old Trafford, i.e. Alex Ferguson. <laughs> okay? So... He's enjoying this. Keep That's going. what I wanted, yeah. <laughs> no, what I mean by that is that if you were part of Alex's, you know, circle of nice guys, you had the stories, you had the access and so forth. And it's true, by the way, of loads of things in the football world as well as, you know, coach in coaches. Uh, you had this network. Arsene was very much le chat parmi les pigeons, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, you have to remember how Fergie reacted when Arsene went on the scene and threatened to kick Manchester United off their fucking perch, to quote Sir mm. Alex. And therefore, there were people within the press corps who are very close to Fergie, who had a perhaps not entirely disinterested attitude towards Arsenal and Arsene Wenger. The fact that he was French as well didn't help. Um, I could carry on like that for a long time. Yeah, yeah. What, what was, what but was, I won't. What was that thing you said about Arsen? He's the what? The, the what pigeon? What was le it? Le chat parmi les pigeons. The cat among the pigeons. The cat, ah, okay. So what's the equivalent uh, expression for Sir Alex Ferguson? Me, <laughs> what's, the, what's the French no, catchphrase for on, him? On the other hand, you, know, you can perfectly... No, uh, I, tr on the I other tried. Hand, I would say that. I mean, I, you have to be fair. It was not Sir Alex Ferguson giving orders or anything like that. It's just a dynamic that was in place and which has been in place for a, a long time. When you're the new guy and the new kid, new kid around the block... It's, you've got to, to make your, your space known and, and you've got to get people to respect you and treat you properly. And the fact that there were cliques around certain clubs more than others does explain some of the treatment you received over the years. And I don't think that's being nasty to, to Sir Alex or, or, or to others, by the way. It's just, it was the natural order of things. And that might explain for me why he certainly, at times, was not treated fair, as fairly as he would have been being somebody else from, from coming from a different country and being, um, managing a different club. I think there are a couple of other things at play. And because Arsene is quite reserved, when he first came uh, over here, he, I mean, you would find certain managers who always answered a question from anyone in the press by saying that journalist's name. Oh, yes, Sam. Or even a nickname. So, but Ar Arsene doesn't do that. Never did. It's not his style. He wants to keep that professional distance. And because he didn't get pally with them, because they couldn't get close to him as a way that they were used to with other journalists, you know, who, uh, many of whom they'd known for many years with, with the managers who'd go back with a Harry Redknapp or a Sam Allardyce or whatever, and it was pally. You know, these, the journalists would have maybe when these guys were, were playing, or younger managers, gone for a drink with them and had lots of off-the-record chat. And that was, Arsene was a world away from all of that. So I think there was inherently some sort of like, oh, you know, almost he's a bit, he's a bit distant. He's, it could even be considered slightly, aloof. yeah, patronising, which I don't think it was in any way. But, Never. but, Never. but I think I could, I, I could see why some of them might have thought that it felt very different to what they were used to. So I think there was never that same kind of affection um, in the same way. What is absolutely true, though, is I remember press conferences where he was asked questions on, with a tone that would never have been used for some other managers. And that is absolutely true. There was a definite lack of respect from some corners. And that's their problem, to be absolutely honest. Mm. Names at the bar afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Not even worth mentioning, because <laughs> he, he's, he's gone out in a blaze of glory with... Um, 10 titles and three community shields because it doesn't count like Jose, community shields amongst his mm. honours. Um, and he has had the last word. All right. Nice. Next yep. question. Uh, 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 I'm actually going to go to this side because I haven't done that yet. Hey, man, what's your question? Yeah, uh, just wondering what you guys think about the, again, coming back to the Emery potential appointment. Does this strike you as reactionary? Because uh, the reports that are coming on Twitter, just looking at my phone recently, is that Arteta turned the job down 
and that they've kind of just gone for Emery. And my, I'm kind of slightly underwhelmed about the appointment, to be honest. I d I, genuinely, I don't know what way to take it because it's, it's a surprise. Um, because everything had pointed to Arteta, that was what was being put out there. And um, I, I don't know how to really judge it yet. We'll have to wait and see what comes out in the wash over the next couple of days. Do you, um, who, who, who do you think is going to be the first to go for a bad pun like Emery Yates? Emery Yates, oh yeah. The Emery Yates Stadium. When, <laughs> when we have a, a really dull nil-nil, it'll be Emery Board. Yeah. Nice. That's nice. Yeah. That's very nice. <laughs> That's as much as I've got. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Amy, any thoughts on that at all? I mean, I, sh I can't imagine Arteta turning that job down. Could he really have done that? That's a, a, a giant uh, thing for him to do, mm. if that was the case. Um, look, we don't know yet, so we're kind of just... <laughs> we're going on speculation. We, we, we might never know. I mean, there were, there were rumours, like... Do you remember when Luis Enrique was 1-2 to two with the bookies? Yeah. And there were people who were telling me, ah, it's got nothing to do uh, with what they're, they're deciding, what they would, would decide. It's got to do with uh, the bookies planting a few stories to make a lot of money, mm. which they did. Just talking of bookies, I, I, there might be someone on this stage who might have put a bet on someone who didn't get the job. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Philippe. <laughs> 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 have you lost a lot of money, Andrew? Or? No. No. <laughs> no. It'd just be a shame, all that Patreon money down the drain. Yeah. <laughs> I put it all on. <laughs> put the fucking house on. Uh, any more questions over this side? Uh, We've got gonna, time for a couple more. A couple more. There's one right. Ten minutes left. And one right here. Like, here we go. go. Hi there. My name is Bobby. Um, I've only been following Arsenal for like the last eight years, although I've lived in London for 20. So I missed all the glory years and have only known a divided Arsenal fan base. <laughs> How long do you think fans will be patient with a new appointment? And if you were the manager of Arsenal, or rather Ivan Gazidis, what would you do to try to unify the fan base? Or is that really a kind of vain thing to even try to do? Oh, um, how long will people be? I hope people will be patient. You know, but there's, I won't say a culture of impatience, but a lot of people have made hay out of impatience and, and yeah. sort of being there are contrarian. Were people who are already impatient and he hasn't been named yet. Yeah, of course. It's I mean, Arsenal fan TV are probably already broadcasting people swearing about yeah. you know, <laughs> or something like that. That's what all the sirens are outside. <laughs> um, look, I would hope so because I don't know that too many people thought, I mean, I think there, there must have been some who would have liked Arsene Wenger to continue, but the vast majority of people from my experience and interaction thought that this was the right time for him to go. So if, if that's your point of view, you've got to give a new guy time. And when Arsene Wenger was appointed, someone posted a, a, um, a headline from one of the tabloids back when, and it was like, Arsenal at war, Arsenal, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it, you know, it was about Arsene Wenger being appointed because everybody was waiting for Johan Cruyff yeah. to be appointed at that time. And Johan Cruyff has you know, such, a, such success as a player, what he did at Barcelona, the style of football, and it was like, oh my God, Johan Cruyff is going to be fucking amazing. And then all of a sudden it's Arsene Wenger. Um, so maybe the outlet wasn't there back then for people to express that. But, you know, that's the difference, I think, now, is that there are these outlets for, for people to make themselves uh, heard. I think um, I, I saw the same uh, clip from, I think it was from The Sun at the time. Um, and uh, the piece was, uh, was written about this kind of uh, Arsenal fans up in arms about this new foreign bloke. And uh, they, 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 they had a, a reaction quoting the Arsenal Action Group, which was basically one bloke. Back then, <laughs> this is how far we've gone. But just in answer to your original question, I, I'm slightly concerned in terms of the amount of patience that will be afforded the new person, simply because of the, the so social media world that we are living in, which is not exactly renowned for its patience in, in any circumstance. Um, so I think the only thing that will really unify the fan base is a team that everybody just gets behind because it's doing really well. That's what's going to make the difference. I think that the fan base is, is, is ripe for everybody getting 
back behind something. I mean, you, you, you just need to look at, at what's going on up at Liverpool with Jurgen Klopp. They've found something to believe in there. Um, everybody around that club, the players, uh, the people involved in the club, the fan base, the city, they, they all believe. And somehow it's going to just take the team to go on some, sort of, to click and go on some brilliant run and people will start to believe again. But I think until that happens, there will be people who just take a position because they take a position because that's what social media is. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's, you, can't, you have to be, or there's this perception that you have to be one way or the other. The middle ground for some people does not exist. And I think the people at the extremes, whichever end of it, tend to shout the loudest and somehow become representative of the fan base when the reality is very different. I think m most people can take a more nuanced view of, of, of most situations regarding the club. So I hope that, you know, look at clicks and headlines and everything else. It's easy to make those out of those extreme points of view. But I hope that, you know, some of the people um, who write the stories and, and write the headlines will, yeah, will have a bit of cop on in that regard, you know? It won't happen. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> well, right, we've got, I think we've got time for one more, James. Okay, let's go right here then. Last question. Hi, it's Matt. Um, are we kidding ourselves? Can Arsenal really ever push on with Cronky at the top? Oh, good question, last question. I, I think it is going to be something we have to deal with, for sure. Um, it's been a concern for me, anyway, for, for quite some time, that maybe in all the focus on Arsene Wenger, and you can understand why this focus on a manager who's been there for so long, that maybe there hasn't been enough focus on what's happening at board level and who's running the club and what decisions are being made and why those decisions are, are being made. So we'll find out now that Arson is gone because that shield, that buttress is not there for them anymore. So I, I have concerns, yeah, that the potential that I think we have as a football club in terms of the stature, the stadium, the resources and everything else available to us I, I do worry that we're not going to achieve that potential with Kroenke at the top of the club. Yeah, uh, that one's not on. yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, wrong mic. I would second that. I think we'll see uh, a Kroenke out banner before we see an Emery out banner. I'll go as far as that. Yeah. Mm. Well, there was one flying over, what was it, Kroenke, you're next, over the... Uh, oh, that's that was true, really yeah. quite sinister, wasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. Kroenke, you're next. Kroenke, <laughs> Kroenke you're next. We're going to fucking that's... get you, man. <laughs> I'm going to drive this plane and you're right into you. you do that. Does so someone get his phone and just leave answering me, showing, you're next. Yeah. You're next. We're going to get <laughs> I don't, yeah, what can you do, though? Jeez, that's... That was terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it was scary. <laughs> it was really scary. But um, the thing is that you wonder how Kroenke... Uh, is going to consider the club in, in the years to come? Is it just a kind of security against the building of that stadium in Los Angeles? Is it going to be the flagship of his um, of Kroenke Enterprises in sports and therefore they've got to be successful? Mm. Exactly. We, we have absolutely got, not got a clue about that. Yeah. And, and also, the, the situation, by the way, at the board within the shareholding has got to be resolved at some point. Because, you know, we don't forget, we've still got the guy called Anisha Rosmanov who is there. But what can anyone do with that shareholder? I don't know. I just don't like it. I think it's very unhealthy. Um, I, it's been poisoning the club for a very long time. Mm. Uh, I, I don't see any way out of it. And I have to say, yes, when, you, you know, there are... It doesn't matter if it's American or whatever. Uh, you know, there are very different kinds of American owners. If you see what... Um, you know, J.W. Henry is doing with Liverpool, you would think, actually, they're doing pretty well. But because they've got a clear idea of what they want the club to be in terms of their business, you can even get the same idea about, uh, about Khan at, at Fulham. I think the pennies dropped, he's realized what he was in for. Mm. But with Kronko, you just don't get, you get, you don't get this feeling that he's understanding what it's all about. The so-called custodianship. Do you remember when Gazidis was talking about that at the mm -hmm. AGM? One of bollocks. <laughs> Honestly. I Com think 
It's complete just, bollocks. The only other thing to factor into this conversation is uh, Josh. Because, um, so the story goes, uh, he came over to London and actually spent some time here at the club, um, checking it out, checking what was going on, and that was part of the whole process. Dad, which Dad, brings it's us not here good. Now. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, but, yeah, but, you know, if part of what's going on is that uh, Stan Kroenke sort of bequeaths the club to his son to run or to be involved in, and it's conceivable that he might have a more active uh, part in this new restructured club going forward. Um, how much does he want it? Because if he really wants it, and he turns around to his dad and says, this is what we need to do, it's going to be amazing, then maybe there's a shift in the mindset. Because otherwise, the everything we've seen thus far um, in terms of the uh, the mindset from Stan Kroenke is n- not to push the boat out and take risks and uh, really be, uh, you know, outwardly ambitious for the club to be successful. So to see a shift in that mindset, whether Josh is potentially a key to that changing, who knows, but it's probably the only chance Arsenal have got under, under the current ownership. Mm. I was just going to say the American sports model, because we shouldn't be dismissive, does allow for people to feel real passion for their franchise or whatever. You know, we shouldn't forget that. It's not because it's the NBA or the NHL or the NFL or the ML, or MLB or MLS that people cannot feel genuine attachment to a club. It, it can happen and it does happen. So we've just got to hope for the best, basically. We'll sit here and cross our fingers and hope for the best. Yeah. We do that. Okay. Well, look, we have to leave it there because, Philippe, you have to... Uh, I have to talk about Emery and Arsenal on French radio. Yeah. So I'll probably be asking the questions. They probably know more than I do. At least you're not going to do 25 minutes on Mikel Arteta first. (laughs) So... That, that was what was planned. <laughs> so there we go. Well, look, uh, live radio, you can wing it, I'm sure. Philippe That's and right. Amy, thank you so much for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks, yeah, for, thanks so uh, much for coming for coming out. It's great to see all of you again. We're going to be hanging around. Feel free to have a beer, stick around. Frantically Googling Unai Emery, basically. (laughs) And this will be available as a podcast tomorrow morning after some uh, judicious editing. (laughs) (laughs) Probably not. I might as well just stick the whole thing out. Yeah. Maybe. Apart from that bit. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Look, we will uh, catch you on the next one. Thanks a million, guys. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.